Hey guys, and welcome to the Original Strength Podcast. This week we have a very special guest, Mr. Alex Salkin, also known as the Hebrew Hammer. The one and, and only. <laughs> the one and only Hebrew Hammer. And today we are going to be talking about original strength, kettlebells, and calisthenics, and how to combine all three of those for the busy person. But before we get into that, Mr. Alex Salkin. Alex, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. So Alex, um, now I know who you are, but... I don't know if all my listeners do. However, you are indeed uh, world famous and you travel the globe teaching kettlebells and calisthenics and all kinds of really cool stuff. But can you just give us a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, that was a great uh, was a great introduction. It's almost as if I had written it myself. Wow. Was, uh, yeah. Who That's knew? Super. We're in sync. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'll give you kind of like the 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 long story. So when I, I grew up kind of like scrawny and goofy and unathletic and, you know, I liked being physically active, but I did not excel at anything. I was, uh, I was not very well coordinated. I really didn't play any sports growing up, uh, picked not quite last, but usually pretty close to last in, in most of the group sports in gym from elementary, middle and high school. And, uh, so I, I wasn't like a natural born athlete. In fact, I remember, there's a story that I, I tell uh, periodically about in my junior year of uh, gym class, we were uh, doing weight training. I think we did weight training like twice a week. And I got like buried on the bench press by like not a lot of weight. I don't remember how much it was, but it was embarrassing. And the uh, so I had to like roll the weight down to my hips so I could move it onto the floor. And my my um, spotter, my the guy who was supposed to be spotting me, it was finger quotes for those who are listening uh, on iTunes or Spotify or whatever, um, he he was talking with a friend. Now, I think he thought this is like chump weight, so this guy's definitely got it. <laughs> well, I didn't. And so the the uh, our, our gym teacher was this like terrifying like monster of a man, and he shouted at this guy. He's like, "What are you doing? You're supposed to be spotting him, and you just you know." And like so, this guy's face was all red. He was like really embarrassed. But I felt like a shame because I was like, man, this is like not a lot of weight. Like what, you know, like none of this stuff really came naturally to me. And it wasn't until later in life that I discovered uh, kettlebells and calisthenics and then eventually original strength that really all the pieces started coming together. And, uh, and it wasn't just one of those things uh, alone. It was all of those things together that really made the biggest difference for me. So it wasn't until early 20s is kind of when it started. I was, uh, I discovered kettlebells. Thanks to a good friend of mine, Drew Christensen, who uh, you know sang the praises of kettlebells like all the time, and he he convinced me to come over and do a, a workout at one point, and I was hooked. Um, spent the next couple of years doing kettlebell training, um, and then discovered calisthenics in around like 2011-ish, and it was in that same year that I read a book called Becoming Bulletproof. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you wrote so. it. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. We'll look it up. But. Uh, but I remember being like, wow, you know what? This makes like it was for me, it was it was kind of like an epiphany moment. I was like, this makes perfect sense. All the stuff has been made like so complex. Like, here's what you have to do to, you know, to uh, to get back to moving your body the way that it's designed to move. But then there was this book, Becoming Bulletproof, that was like, well, if you just move your body the way that it's supposed to move, it'll move the way that it's supposed to move. And I was I was very intrigued. It was to you know the funny thing now too is that it seems like such a uh, such a, a an obvious thing, but at the time for me it was really revolutionary. And so I kind of followed the you know the movements in the book, uh, you know like the crocodile breathing, segmental rolling, the rocking, the crawling, and uh, and I started doing it with my with my clients. And I was noticing like, wow, you know what, like a lot of them really don't do this. They, they, a lot of them can't really do this stuff very well. So they really need this because this is like, you know, this is the way that we're designed to move. I love kettlebells, for example, and obviously I love calisthenics, but you know, we're not, we're able to do pushups, but we're designed to move in ways that makes those, makes those pushups possible. And once I turn original strength into, into like the base for my movement training and and uh, the, then and the same for my students, everything started to change. And uh, in uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up the the bio here a little bit, but I in 2013 I moved to Israel and uh, was one of the I was one of the first. I mean there were other people who were talking about natural movement and and 
uh, what have you, but I was one of the first who was doing it. I was the first person teaching original strength in Israel. And, uh, and it was very interesting to, to see other people have the same response that I had when I was first introduced to it. Like, this makes sense, but this sounds too simple to work. And like, you know, I would tell them, just let's just try it. Let's see how it works. And, and they were hooked. And so I got a chance to, uh, um, I got a chance to not only teach it to my, my clients one-on-one -on -one there, but from there I got a chance to actually start flying to other countries and, you know, teaching workshops or, or assisting at workshops teaching both original strength, uh, as well as my own workshops on kettlebell and bodyweight training, in which I always, of course, uh, do some evangelization of uh, original strength along the way. And, uh, and so here I am today, I, I do the same thing. Uh, I travel to teach whenever I can, uh, and I, I do a lot of stuff online to reach out to people that I otherwise would normally not be able to reach, to try to help them go from there being buried under a bench press in front of their peers and embarrassed, to being strong, fit, and able, uh, and doing it in the ways that are simple and that the way that the body was designed to move. So that's really, well, that's all an awesome bio, um, but I got, I, I'm trying to <laughs> close the gap in my own mind for my own timeline, um, because how, how long have you been coaching? I got certified in October of 2010. Uh, went through a kettlebell certification, and I think I got—I had my first. I started teaching friends shortly after that, um, or like guest teaching at the class of my coach, mentor, and friend Scott Stevens. Um, but I think my first full-time client was like around January of 2011. So it's closing in on almost nine years. Okay, um, and the reason I'm trying to close the gap in my mind is because so since I've known you and I knew of you before I knew you um, you were actually one of the first guys I saw do calisthenics on YouTube um, <laughs> and you were because I was all into combat conditioning uh, with uh, Matt Fury absolutely Matt Fury's and a man so I was looking up his stuff and I did a I found a YouTube video of you and I will never forget this as long as I live. You were sitting, I think you were doing some, I forget, you're doing something in the royal court, but you in, introduced the video. You opened it up with saying, you might be wondering why I'm sitting here in this come hither pose. <laughs> I know exactly the video you're talking about. And that was the first time I ever saw Alex Salkin and <laughs> I was just, I was mesmerized um, just because you're, you're so charismatic and you're also doing the stuff I was interested in. Yeah. But, so in my mind, you've always been famous. <laughs> so <it's> really, <laughs> that's awesome. So I'm telling you that because the first time I ever saw you in person was at an original strength workshop. And I was excited that you were there because I thought you were just, I mean, you are famous, but like, yeah. I was just so, I was so excited you were there because you were my first, uh, I guess I was one of my first, uh, in, internet group, uh, instructors that I was a groupie of. Wow. So, just closing that gap for you. Folks, just so you know, anybody who's watching or listening, this is the first I'm hearing of that. Now, I knew you had seen that video, but I didn't realize that like I was, you know, that was one of the first videos that you had seen. Yeah. So that's uh, that's very cool for me. So I was researching everything I could about combat commissioning um, because, you know, it's hard to look at a book and understand. You can read the movements, read about them and stuff. But unless you actually see them play out, the pictures on the pages just don't do it justice. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to find movement to match what I was learning in the book just so I could make sure I was doing it correctly. And that's that's when I just stumbled on the Hebrew hammer. That's amazing. Wow, that's very cool. Isn't it? That's kind of neat. Um, and now here we are talking together about calisthenics and kettlebells and combining original strength. Who would have thought? So let me ask you this. Um, when, you, when you were telling me about your ideas, um, you were talking about combining all three of these things for a busy person, mm -hmm. um, like somebody that's working uh, long hours at the office. Is it, is it possible to have, and I know the answer to this, but I want you to, to tease it out for me, short, effective workouts with little to no equipment with kettlebells, body weight training, or natural movement? Absolutely. And in fact, um, now I think that the ideal combination for anybody who's either, either a busy person in general or a busy professional who either you know, owns a business or has like a very hectic and high-stress job uh, I think that those three are a great trifecta: kettlebells, body weight, and of course, you know, original strength as the movement and and, uh, and movability, as I like to call it, the movability portion of it. But even if all you have is just the original strength part, 
you'd be amazed at the kind of results that you'll get. Um, I remember a number of years ago, I was attending a workshop um, that was uh, being taught by our friend Dan John, and it was called Reasonableness. And I have to say, you know, for, for such a boring sounding title, it was one of the most important workshops I've ever been to. And I think that if he ever does one again and he says, hey, I'm doing a reasonable I'm doing a reasonableness workshop, you need to sign up because I learned so much stuff from that one workshop that I then applied to my students for like the next four years while I lived in Israel that uh, uh, it, it was just astonishing. One of the things that, um, that I learned from him in that workshop was the importance of just like little and often over the long haul. You know, like yes. we have this, this idea that in the fitness industry that it's like, you got to go hard all the time. You got to give it 110%. And I think it's possible to work yourself into a position where you can do that with at least certain things. Uh, but, you know, like that's a pretty big leap for most people to, to jump into. And the same thing goes with, you know, like there's no question you'll be fitter if you spend 60 minutes a day, six days a week working out. But if the options are zero or six days a week for 60 minutes, you're already a lot closer to zero. And it's going to be a lot easier to stick with that. So um, I had a, a women's group in particular uh, just outside of Jerusalem. And this was at a time in 2015 when I was traveling like a whole lot. Like I think I traveled abroad eight times that year. And uh, the the ladies were like, you know, we like we really need uh, – it, like every so, it, it seems like every couple of weeks, you know, we like we have to cancel the classes because you're going to be traveling. You know, we just we need more instruction. We need more help. We need more guidance. And I was like, you know, here's what we're going to do, because you're right. Um, one of the things for me is that I wanted that I want I knew that, you know, at one point or another, the classes were going to end, whether it was in a few months or a few years, they were going to be on their own. And I wanted to give them something that I knew would help them no matter what. And that they wouldn't need me for, right? Which is like, I mean, this is not good, like from a business perspective. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be like, hey, here's how you can not need me. But if you really want to help people, you want to give them the tools so, so that, you know, let's say I win the lottery, and I'm like, yeah, you know what, I'm just not gonna, I'm just not gonna teach this class anymore. They'll still be in good shape. And so what I said was, we had a, we had a, a group messaging or a messaging group set up, and I said every day you're gonna do just five minutes of movement. Uh, and, and that's it. You can pick whatever movement it is. It could be just laying on the floor doing some diaphragmatic breathing. Um, it could be crawling. It could be, you know, uh, going for a walk. But you owe me five minutes. And when the five minutes is up, you can stop. But if you want to keep going, you can keep going. And everybody, nobody ever missed a day. Everybody got in their five minutes. And everybody was checking in. So there was this, this accountability um, which was very nice. But what was really interesting that happened was that people were starting to get in 10 minutes a day, 15, 20 minutes, almost without fail. And periodically, like, I could only get in the five minutes today. But they knew that that was their only commitment. Their goal might be to do more, but their commitment was just five minutes. And and that part is 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 cool. But the coolest part was the results that they started to get. Because, and, and I'm you know, these were people who were not like... Uh, natural born athletes like so if people hear this and they think oh well you know no one's gonna say hey Usain Bolt just run for five minutes a day and then you know you'll still be a world champ people like him certainly need a lot more but like most of the people you're gonna train are not gonna be like that so uh the the gals that I was training were largely sedentary or they had done other group fitness things before but for some reason or another whether it was through a tweak or an injury or you know uh, time constraints they just couldn't keep doing it but this was something they could keep doing. Uh, and one of the gals in particular, Senya, said that she had been in a bad car accident a few years prior. She used to have to see a chiropractor like once a week just to get her adjusted, uh, you know, to get her just functioning normally again. And she told me she hadn't seen her chiropractor in three months. And her, her chiropractor called her, was like, is everything OK? You haven't been in, you know, like I haven't heard from you. I just want to make sure everything's all right. And she's like, yeah, I've just been feeling great. You know, I've been I've been moving better. And and uh, and I think she would still see her periodically when she needed it. So it's not like, you know, like I didn't cure her of anything. But by getting her back in touch with uh, with the basic movements that kept her body in line, her her chiropractic visits were 
uh, there were a lot fewer and further between. Um, she, when she would have a flare up, her big thing was rocking. Like rocking for her was like, was like money. I mean, so she would get down on the ground. She would rock. That was like her, one of her favorite things to do. And like back issues she had, hip issues she had, like they would, I mean, it didn't, again, it didn't cure her. It's not like the damage that she had sustained wasn't there anymore, but her body could, could function properly and she could do the things she could not do before. Um, and so one of the thing, the biggest thing that I learned from this is that not only is it possible to get in truly effective workouts, meaning ones that actually affect a change in your, in your life and in your, your quality of life, but you can do it with, with pretty much no equipment other than a little bit of floor, uh, floor space and, you know, as little as five minutes. That's awesome. So if all you had was your body and floor space, just five minutes a day could make a noticeable difference in your quality of life, basically. Yeah. And I think that's the case, even if you're already quite athletic, because, you know, one of the things that uh, I've been keeping up with the, uh, the updates from the, uh, the unlock your body group coaching course. And some of the things I see people saying, um, you know, cause I, I like follow it pretty closely. It's really amazing. And, you know, there are some people that I know who are, who are either colleagues or are people, uh, you know, that I've spoken with and I know that they're very fit people. Like they're all saying, oh, I'm like, I feel better. You know, like I've got so much more energy. Like I'm not stiff and achy when I, when I get up in the morning. So it's not just for people who are starting at zero. It's also for people who are, who are starting, far, far higher than, you know, than the average person. And, uh, yeah, and I, that's one of the things that I think people forget about is that regardless of, of how advanced you are or, uh, or, you know, what, what achievements you've made, uh, there's always going to be a need to move the way that you were made to move. And so the, when you get further and further away from that, uh, you're going to start to find that struggles are going to pile up and something as simple as just getting on the ground moving the way that you're supposed to, no, no equipment, just doing the, you know, the, the OS resets, uh, will make such a tremendous difference that it's, uh, it, it, you, it has to be seen to be believed, but, right. but you will see it. No, uh, I, yeah. And, and I'm a believer because I, I've experienced it and I see, I've seen it too. Um, but personally for yourself, you wrote a story or an article recently, uh, very recently about how, when you, started pressing reset yourself, you were able, your kettlebell, uh, lifting improved. Mm -hmm. Like you were able lot. to, I think it was, uh, how so? Like, I know you had a story about how many times you could squat, uh, two 24 kilogram bells, but like, like, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So this was, um, actually, I guess it would have been last month. It would mark seven years ago that you and I met because it was at the uh, becoming bulletproof workshop and, uh, in Chicago. And I remember, we went through, it was kind of a shortened version of, of what we do now in OS, but I remember thinking like, man, this is like, this is genius, you know, like progressions, regressions, it's so obvious, you know, like, why didn't I think about this? And one of the things that we, that we had to do is there was an indoor track. It wasn't like one of those quarter mile tracks, so I don't want anybody thinking I'm like superhuman just yet, but, uh, but it was long and, uh, and I remember- pretty superhuman. It, well, <laughs> it felt like it at the very least, because I remember uh, we were like, okay, um, we're all going to go over to this, this indoor track here and we're going to crawl around it. See how, how many times you can see how, how few times you can like, you know, rest or whatever. And I was determined to not rest at all. And I made it the whole way around, uh, without resting, uh, with a leopard crawl. I, I want to, uh, uh, point that out. So it wasn't like just a baby crawl. It was a leopard crawl. And I mean, my thighs burned like, you know, like nothing I've ever felt before. And I was like, holy moly, like if I could do that daily, I bet my legs would get pretty strong. I'm sure everything would get really strong. So um, it was shortly after I got back from that workshop, I, I stopped squatting altogether, which, you know, in, in the world of strength training, whether you prefer kettlebells and body weight or barbells or whatever, that's like heresy, you know, yeah, like squats. You, are, just, you just committed the biggest sin possible. I did. <laughs> but... I recanted of that heresy later by adding the squats back in. But for two months, I, I just crawled every day and, uh, and I didn't squat. I know, you know, the, the squat police are, are currently looking for my, my current address. That's why I don't list it. But, uh, the, but the amazing thing was 
for at the time, this is 2012, uh, right at the beginning of 2013 is when I when I retested it. But in 2012, I could do like a set of 10 squats with uh, like two 53 pound kettlebells or two 24 kilo kettlebells. And um, anyway, and that's not really, you know, anything to write home about. Like I've got kind of chicken legs. But so for me, it was actually impressive. But but after not squatting for two months and just crawling, I picked them up. And I squatted them for 20 reps. And I remember the first 17 were like dead easy. The last three was a little bit of a grind, but I, I, I got it on film and it's on my YouTube channel. Um, and uh, I remember thinking like, if I wasn't convinced before, like, th like this did it. Like I I'm totally convinced now. Um, and on top of that, later on, I tested out my pistol squat and I could still do a pistol with 32 kilos or 70 pounds on either leg. And I got also to do 20 in a row, uh, well, I, which I could do before, meaning I didn't lose any strength or stamina in my pistols. And, and this was without practicing them for, for months. So I, I was definitely convinced. Um, I, I was hooked beyond hooked. In fact, I couldn't stop talking about it. Um, but, uh, and as a result, original strength ended up becoming like a staple in my own training for, uh, for kettlebells and body weight. And, uh, and it wasn't just a fluke because I mean, the results kept like just pouring in and all sorts of different moves. It wasn't just lower body stuff. The same went with like upper body training, um, pushing, pulling, what have you, like the better I moved with the original strength resets, the better my strength got. That's awesome. Um, all right. So your love for kettlebells, um, and your love for helping people improve their lives. So you help people restore their their function, uh, help them press reset and restore their reflexive strength. If you had to pick three kettlebell movements for the average person to help them get stronger, what would it be? Well, this is probably not going to sound particularly uh, original, but um, I would say swing for sure because um, well, I'll say them all and then I'll explain them all. So the swing, the Turkish getup, and the goblet squat. Okay. If I could add in a fourth one, I would add in rows because I think that it's just very, very important to have strong back. Um, but the reason for all of those is because uh, I try to draw a connection with my students uh, and anybody who follows me in like, what are these movements going to give you beyond just your ability to perform these movements? Um, and I think it's easy to get, uh, to get lost and kind of divorce exercise from movement but the more you can understand, like from a perspective of how uh, how you're supposed to move and the things you're supposed to be able to do in your in your day to day life, the uh, the more the more it'll make sense why you're doing the certain things that you're doing. It's not just because it gives you a good workout, but because it actually helps you to to honor your design and just become the best possible human that you can. So for swings, uh, picking things up off the ground is like absolutely essential and there are so many stories of people who throw their back out trying to pick up a washcloth in the shower or you know herniated disc picking up their groceries because they just never learned how to hinge through the hips and they just never learned how to how to engage all the the powerful muscles on the back side of their body and swings help you to do that they also help you to very effectively learn how to move explosively through the low body and as much as I like sprinting, and I know you like sprinting as well, um, the average person is just, at least at the beginning, is not going to, uh, it's going to take them a long time before they're, they're in sprinting condition. It can definitely be done, but uh, I have a uh, friend and colleague, uh, Franz Snydman, who's a, like a sprinting expert, and he says the same thing. Like, you know, he's had people, he's trained people who are like in their 70s, and it's taken maybe a few years, but he's worked them up to being able to sprint. And he's done a lot of like progressions to help get them there along the way. But if you think if it's going to take maybe two years before someone can safely sprint, that's two years of training time uh, of explosive lower body training that, that they're losing if they're not doing something else that is a little bit more accessible to them. Uh, and Franz and any sprinting expert will tell you like this is a high level skill and it's not something that you want to just try to uh, throw on to people right off the bat because it can, it can cause some damage. They're made to do it, but they have to be they have to be warmed up for it. Uh, swings are far more accessible and they allow people to get that explosive movement in. And uh, I mean, who knows, it might even shorten the, the amount of time it will take before they're able to do uh, sprints safely. So that would be number one. And number two, the Turkish getup, uh, getting off the ground, picking things up off the ground is huge. 
getting off the ground is, I mean, it could save somebody's life. If you have uh, um, an elderly, elderly clients, elderly family members, um, this is one of the things that they fear most. I had a, uh, I'll go into a slight tangent. I had a, a student also in, in Israel named Sue who had been sedentary. I mean, she was, when I started working with her, she was 75 years old. She had been sedentary most of her life. She told me literally every time we worked out how much she hated exercise. But uh, she was, at the time, she was a candidate for a double knee replacement surgery. And as she told it, like, the results could either be great or you might never walk again, like, at her age. And she knew somebody who had uh, his knees replaced and, like, he couldn't walk under his own power ever again. Um, and, uh, and he was advanced age as well. And, uh, so her physical therapist, who's a friend and colleague of mine said, just work with Alex for a few months. If it doesn't work, then you can get the knee replacement. Um, so we started working together and one of the things we did all the OS resets and we did some basic stuff like getting up and down off of a chair, pro progressively going with lower chairs, things like that. But I also made her every, she had to get on the ground a lot, but we would also practice getting up and down off the ground. And I showed her some stuff that is relevant to Turkish get up technique without actually using any weight. It was just basically being able to get up um, under her own power using less and less of her hands as she did it. And eventually at, uh, I think she was about 76 by this point, she could get up off the ground from her back. She could get up without having to hold on to any furniture, without you know having to hold on to my hand. And uh, she would tell her friends, or her friends would ask her, so what do you do with this personal trainer guy? Because they all had, you know, fitness classes that they attended. She's like, a lot of getting up and down off the ground. And they were like, are you serious? She's like, well, yeah. And they were like, well, we never get on the ground in our, in our fitness classes. Like, th like, the prospect of having to help an older person up off the ground, I think, is a, is a scary thing for a lot of people. And uh, But if you really want to improve people's lives, and they don't even have to be like elderly, because this is relevant for people who are in their in their 30s or 40s. Um, Absolutely. Being able to, yeah, being able to get up off the ground under your own power with minimal use of your hands is like, I mean, you, like you just gave them the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. And so the Turkish getup, even if it's unweighted, like Dan John, I watched a video of him recently saying that he prefers um, unweighted getups with people. He said he doesn't really weight them, but he, he, he still does them because, I mean, it, it's a, an incredible exercise. Very, very important. Um, and uh, whether you use a light kettlebell, a heavy kettlebell, or no kettlebell, uh, a Turkish getup is is essential. I think. I mean, you can get pressing movements, um, you know, by with body weight exercises or with dumbbells. But the the, the kettlebell is really great for Turkish getups if you want to load it up, and because it's so closely associated with kettlebells, even though you can certainly do it with uh, uh, you know dumbbells and barbells and that sort of a thing, uh, like. It not only is getting up off the ground going to give your client more than you could ever hope for in, in 10 other exercises, but there's a reset in there. You can roll. That's that's huge. It's, the segmental roll will really build your Turkish getup. And this is kind of where you also start to see uh, the the congruence between uh, the kettlebell movements and original strength. And this is only like a part of it because I could go into you know how to build up your swing, your press, all these other things. But then the last one, <coughs> pardon me, would be the goblet squat. Because again, this is another Dan John move. We should have just invited <laughs> Dan. Um, but uh, but he was the progenitor of the the goblet squat. And one of the things that that he pointed out that he really liked about it is it teaches the squat pattern very very simply. And um, squatting, even if you don't really care to go all that heavy, um, it's a fundamental movement. It's the human resting position. Uh, if you look at most countries around the world, I mean, some people call it the third world squat. I think that's, you know, it's that's, kind of that's, silly. That's arrogance, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, you're supposed to squat like that too. It's not not just them. Yeah. Um, but uh, but having the ability to move all of the joints of your lower body through their full range of motion uh, simultaneously is great for your mobility. It's great for your health. It's actually very good for your low back too, because um, many people who can't squat uh, have very tight hips. You know, it's not necessarily a matter of strength; it's often a matter of mobility. And the tight hips will will are absolute murder on your low back because your low back has to pick up for a lot of the movement that your hips are supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, the goblet squat teaches you how to do it very quickly, simply, effectively, 
Um, and if those are the only three kettlebell movements that you did, uh, I think you would be just fine in terms of your fitness. Right on. So, but I'm going to, you didn't, you, you mentioned a fourth one, if you had oh, the to pick, and, and I thought that was actually, um, I was, I'm curious about that. I, I know exactly why you chose it, but in the kettlebell community, rows are talked about very, very little. So let's yeah. talk about, talk about the row. I think, I don't know actually why rows are not mentioned more. Um, cause it, I, I never really hear anybody talking down about them. They just kind of are like, Oh, well, you know, for your back, you just do pull-ups. They're like, afterthoughts, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, to me, it's, it's silly. One, now one of the things, and again, this is where, um, I like to look at, at things in terms of what people want because people want to get stronger. They want to look good. Everybody wants to look good naked. I don't care what they tell you. Like, oh, I just want to feel better. Okay, but but you wouldn't be upset if you looked in the mirror and all of a sudden these bodybuilder poses, you know, that you wouldn't even thought to do before. Like, you like looking at your guns. Exactly. You like doing the Superman pose. Well, um, I also like to look at things in terms of what people need in, in addition to what they want. And, uh, you know, all of our favorite movements on average, like overhead pressing, and Turkish getup is included with this, um, push-ups, you know, pull-ups, they all involve uh, a lot of shoulder internal rotation at, at the top of the movement. And that's not bad. You need that uh, because that's an essential part of the movement. But uh, shoulder, but keeping your shoulders, ex getting them externally rotated as well as in neutral positions is very important for their health. Um, it's important for your posture and you get that with the row row will kind of keep your shoulder a bit more neutral. Whereas, uh, some of the other cool pulling movements that we like, namely pull-ups, they do require that internal rotation. And, and I, the reason I bring this up is because so few people, I mean, most people sit hunched over a computer all day and then they hunch over to drive home, right. Or, or sit on the bus or, you know, uh, on the train or whatever on their commute. They sit down to watch TV. You know, they, they sit down for, for pretty much everything. And just that act of being slouched is going to also further internally rotate your shoulders. Uh, you add on to the fact that uh, as you age, we have a ten certain muscles have a tendency to get tighter and others have a tendency to get uh, looser. And, uh, and one of those things is, is it's your posture. And so the, the muscles in your chest tend, and as well as your biceps tend to get a bit tighter and, so they're just going to further internally rotate your shoulders. And so uh, it's a greater likelihood that you're going to tweak something, uh, maybe even dislocate them. And you're really not uh, going to, you're, you're not going to overdo it on, on rows, most likely. They're very gentle for the body, um, very easy to do them even daily uh, and, and see some great results. They help uh, improve your posture. They strengthen muscles that uh, pull-ups don't always necessarily get. And they're more accessible to more people. Um, I think anybody, in fact, I'm 99% I'm sure that just about anybody can work up to doing a pull-up. But uh, the foundation for pull-ups is, is rows, basically. And uh, the better you are at those, the easier uh, pull-ups will become later on down the line. Um, and if you've already got kettlebell there, you might as well add to it. Uh, you know, Doing something to strengthen your back is going to do a lot for your overall health, um, it's going to do a lot for your resilience, and uh, frankly, you're going to look cool. Your T-shirts are going to fit a little tighter. You know, you might not even have to, you know, walk by a, a mirror shirtless to, in, you know, to impress yourself as you're walking by any reflective surface. You can just look like, wow, man, the back's looking pretty good. You know, like I'm looking a bit wider, and uh, nobody has a problem with that. Nobody that I've met so far. Yeah, I've I've never met anybody where a strong back was a detriment to them. Um, Correct. Yeah. So. All right, so those are your top three kettlebell movements. Um, and by the way, like, I don't know if anybody's ever thought about this. I think one of the biggest benefits or, I guess, it pluses of a kettlebell is that it's, I'm, I love body weight uh, movements and calisthenics. But a kettlebell really is, it just, it's like body weight plus just a little yeah. bit. Um, so it's just another way, to me, it's a way to load calisthenics, basically. Um, totally. So speaking of, like, and like I said, I first met you, uh, showing a video about the Royal court. Um, yeah. what are your, what are your go-to calisthenic movements? Well, I'm right now I'm in a phase where I'm trying to, uh, kind of go back to the basics and, uh, and really master them because for quite some time and my Instagram channel will bear witness to this. I, you know, I did a lot of stuff. 
that was flashy and was cool. And, you know, it was kind of me putting to the test uh, the skills that I had built up over the course of a number of years. But um, lately I've been greasing the groove with push-ups. Greasing the groove just means that uh, at random intervals throughout the day, you'll do uh, like a sub-maximal set. So you're not trying to max out with any particular movement. You might do like 25 to 50% of what you could do in an all-out effort. So like, let's say for push-ups, if you could only do, if you could do like 10 good reps, you might do like, you know, two to five throughout the day, just completely at random. So I'm doing something like that based on a, uh, a program that I wrote a few months ago. And I'm really enjoying it. Like I'm finding, like I've got the, I've got more, more capacity uh, for my push-ups. Um, I'm enjoying the challenge, and I look pretty good when I look in the mirror. I'm like, oh wow, you know, triceps you're, are really popping. You're you know? a stud. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling like a stud. And uh, but also rows. Um, I've really been doing a lot of those lately. Uh, some pull-ups and so on and so forth. So to answer your question, actually, what I would say. Um, I'm going to give maybe two answers. So I think, again, for, like for everybody, what you should be first focused on if uh, calisthenics uh, is what you're after is push-ups, rows, and if I could only pick a third one, I'm going to pick a wild card most people wouldn't expect, but I would say the hip thrust. And I, now I otherwise I would say lunges uh, because I think lunges are great, but the but the hip thrust is very good because um, as much as I like lunges, uh, again I mentioned you know as people get older certain muscles have a tendency to get tighter and what have you and we spend so much time seated, um, lunges are going to strengthen uh, some of the muscles that have a tendency to get a bit tighter like your quads, your hip flexors, uh, and that's great that's what they're supposed to do. But if if you're getting back into it uh, and you're starting to get you're trying to get fitter. I would say that the hip thrust would be the way to go because it's going to strengthen your, your glutes, which are, in my opinion, criminally underused by most people. Uh, we have a tendency to move through our, our, uh, you know, our quads and, and low back, and we just kind of skip over the glutes a bit. Um, it's going to help stretch out the hip flexors. Uh, it's going to also help strengthen the hamstrings, and, uh, and it's very easy to do. Really, I mean, and and it's also easy to start adding some reps on. So if you want to get in a good workout, uh, you can do like a lot of hip thrusts, and you can even do them daily, and uh, it, it's not going to be too detrimental to you. So those would be the uh, the three that I would say everybody should start with. And I would say if you want to work your way up to um, to body weight movements that are going to be that are going to challenge you, and that the process of getting there is really going to uh, is really going to transform your strength and your movement. I would say the one-arm push-up, uh, L-sit pull-up, and a pistol squad. And so the reason why the one-arm push-up, I mean, that's just cool. Like it you've never cool. seen it. Yeah, you've never seen anybody. Now, I know you like it because I, I still marvel at the video I've, I saw of you doing like five one-arm, one-leg push-ups, like it was your job, yeah. like a number of years ago. <laughs> um, and uh, but one-arm push-ups are are awesome because the, in order to do them, you have to be very well tied together. And in fact, crawling is a, a phenomenal way. Uh, and if I recall correctly, that was one of the principal means by which you worked up to the one-arm, one-leg push-up. Uh, so that was actually the way I discovered I had a one-arm, one-leg push-up. I never there trained it. I, I, it. Training, it was not. It was never in my wheelhouse. Um, yeah. So if it weren't for crawling, I, I, I mean, I, to me, that's what glued me together to be able to do it. And and I know that before that, uh, you you had been lifting kettlebells, you'd lifted barbells, so you had the strength, but you know, not being tied together was what stopped you. And this is where right. people go wrong because they divorce exercise from movement, and it, the exercise becomes a supplement. It's like if you were to go to a new like to a store and be like, well, I'm going to get you know supplements for this vitamin, and you know I'm going to get this protein supplement, but then like you're not really eating real food, you're going to be missing a lot, and and you're going to you know, like the, the, the supplements will nourish you to a certain degree, but they're supposed to add on. And so, you know, for you, once you, once you got back to your, your, uh, your, the way that you were made to move, your natural movement, uh, namely by the gait pattern via uh, crawling, that's when you, you were able to put that strength to good use. And um, one-arm push-ups really require that you be well tied together in order to do them. I worked up to them before I started getting into crawling. Um, and uh, the process was doable, but it was also a little more complex. You know, there was some programming involved and whatever. But, um, but after I started crawling, I, I found that I could maintain it pretty easily. 
because I still had the strength that I needed. Right. Um, and and I was I was better glued together. Um, the pistol squat is a great example uh, of a movement that is not only requires a lot of stability, a lot of strength, uh, but also again the ability to move all the the joints of your lower body in unison at the same time and using strength. Um, and again, they're also very cool, so that never hurts. But they they also require the the non-working leg has to have a good amount of strength to just stay right out in front of you. So, I mean, you can do variations where, you know, your leg kind of just hangs a bit, but um, but it will give you a lot of strength uh, against gravity. And basically, commandeering your body against gravity is, like, the single most is, like essential skill that you need to have. Um, if you can lift big weights, but, again, you have a hard time getting off the floor, uh, you know, you can't lift your, your knee up to your belt line level, like being able to do those things is you're not going to lose any strength doing it. In fact, you're probably going to unlock quite a bit more. Um, and then with that said, the last one would be the L sit pull up because again, it, it's going to strengthen your back. It's going to strengthen your midsection and the strength that you get. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when we do dead bugs and, and our core lights up like crazy because our, now our core has to stabilize our legs moving in free space. Well, you're doing that in, in a, you're doing it kind of like, vertically basically because your legs are out in front of you uh your your stomach muscles have to fire up like crazy to keep them out there and at the same time you have to introduce movement elsewhere namely in in your back and through your arms um doing those i mean i think you'd have about all the strength that you'd ever need now there's a huge gulf between rows push-ups and and hip thrusts and then pistols one-arm push-ups and l-sit pull-ups but uh but you know the details. You can you can cover those later. But but if you make those your focus, you'd be you'd be good to go. So let me ask you this. Um, you well, I'll just go ahead and do. You're you're a phenomenal coach. Um, I think you're you're well. You're witty. And you made me laugh, <laughs> but you're brilliant. You know how to appreciate. Really, you know how to really tie things together. If there is a office Joe is out there right now, and he he wants to just really get 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 his life back get his his health back his, his ability to move but he also wants to get stronger and he wants to do it correctly how could how can they get in touch with you like do you have a a place they could go like i mean because your wisdom i mean we're not going to be able to span it in 40 like in this little podcast for somebody right. to get a good program so say office joe wants to get started and wants to work himself up to l sit pull-ups and one-arm push-ups or even just just being able to do you know, regular push-ups regularly. Mm-hmm. Where can he go to find out more about you? Well, I'm on all the major social media channels, and I have a website. But my all my grade A uh, info always goes out. I have a daily email list, and um, that's where I spend the majority of my time. Uh, I again, I send out an email that's got information on. I always talk about kettlebells, calisthenics, uh, original strength strategies for, uh, for moving better, things of that nature. It's where I'm most active and it's where you're most likely to actually uh, get the most out of the content that I, that I regularly produce. Um, a great way to do that is, well, there'll be two ways. So number one is uh, I have a, uh, a, a eight week kettlebell and body weight challenge. That's just two movements a day, five days a week, 20 minutes at a time, a free PDF. You can download it and it will put you automatically on my email list. I'll send you a link Uh, that you can include in the show notes. Um, And then I've also got another one coming out soon called 99 Body Weight and Kettlebell Workouts, uh, which is 99 of my best kettlebell, body weight, and original strength workouts all in one place. And uh, it's also going to include a couple of articles that I wrote specifically for the report and uh, includes seven calisthenic exercises you should never do. Um, The number one quote-unquote dangerous calisthenics exercise to bulletproof your knees um, and uh, three myths about kettlebells that won't die. And uh, I think that, well, I kill them, but they prior to the, to the report, they would not die. Um, I had to find the appropriate stake to, you know, drive through their hearts. But, uh, but those are, those would be the places to, uh, to go because again, it'll put you on my daily email list. I'm I'm far more active there uh, than on social media. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm like everybody else. I check my email like a thousand times a day. 
So like if you've got a question, you'll be able to reach me pretty easily. All right. So be sure to send us uh, those links because if you're yeah, listening, we'll if you're listening, Alex is brilliant um, and he can definitely help you regain your body and get just as strong as you want to be. Um, Alex, I got one more question for you. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the most important one of the day. Crunchy peanut butter or creamy peanut butter? Crunchy, for sure. My now, I, I like creamy peanut butter. As a matter of fact, I have a little bit in my cabinet right now. But uh, there's something about crunchy peanut butter that's like, it's the texture plus the added explosion of peanut flavor. Um, I'm going to have to go with that. Right on. That's right here. We're, we're, we're on the same page. We're on the same I, I didn't. Page. I didn't lose your admiration that you that did not. began with the YouTube video all those years ago. So just so you know, you probably haven't you haven't seen it yet. So when Dan John answered the question, he went with creamy. I but still respect him. But I well, I respect him because of his explanation of creamy. He said okay. that it was just more useful to him. He can do more with it. He does love crunchy, but he has found that throughout his years, it's just easier to use creamy on a lot of things. So I, I, can I, see I get that. that. I yeah, do. absolutely. No, I, I can respect that. Again, whenever he has an answer, I'm, I'm, I always want to scoop my chair in and listen a little closer. I think and, it's uh, the, I think, it's the reasonability of it all. I think. That's exactly it. You nailed it, man. <laughs> hey, man, uh, I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. This is this edition of the Original Strength Podcast. For more about Alex, check the notes in the uh, – if you're listening on iTunes, it'll be in the uh, notes comment section. And if you're on YouTube, it will be down below the video. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of the Original Strength Podcast. If you made it this far, thank you so much.